Okay, so this is one of my favorite sort of things is, you know, taking a um, very, very simple um, problem. So in this case, I'm going to give you a, a potential. So I want to take a very simple um, problem with a tiny minuscule twist. And since it is a twist that I've um, talked about in class, it's not much of a twist at all. Actually, it's in the book. It's in um, my notes. So it's something that you should be able to um, be able to do, and that's to take some sort of uh, potential function. So I've got a potential here, and I'm going to have that equal to some constant, and it's v naught prime is the constant. And the reason why there's a prime is because this v naught has is going to have different units than this v, and I just want to make that explicit. All right. Um, that should help you, not hinder you, um, although uh, people do look for excuses to be hindered. So I've got this potential, and I want to find, I just want to go down our ladder. Remember we had a ladder from potential, from potential to um, charge distribution. Um, so if we're going down our ladder, we start with the potential, and then we find the electric field. And so the electric field is the next rung down the ladder after the potential, right? And then we go down the next rung and we find our sources, which are, our, um, yeah, and we'll find our sources. And call, just call them sources, uh, which are charge distributions, which is rho, let's say, or possibly a sigma, or possibly a lambda, and maybe even a q. We don't really know at this point. I do, but you don't. We don't really know at this point what makes this um, really simple looking function. Now you're saying, well, I don't know what the maximum of x and y is. Well, you know what the maximum of x and y is. If x is 3 volt, or is 3 meters, and y is 2 meters, then 3 is greater than 2, right? So we've got 3 meters in this um, max function, and so that's what comes out. So that's um, a really fairly simple um, sort of function to work with. Uh, it, I mean, it, you might be marginally confused by it, um, and you're allowed to be marginally confused. Um, that's fine. I mean, if you're confused, start thinking about what something could be. I mean, I'm not going to give you anything difficult in this class, right? Um, so. That's, that's fine. Now, one of the reasons why I asked you to draw a representation here is so that if you have something that's marginally confusing, right, you can go ahead and just sketch it out, right? So let's look at where um, v is equal to v naught prime, okay? Um, so we'll just choose some, some place that we can look at z equals zero. We could look at any other z as well, because this has absolutely no z dependence. It doesn't matter. Um, so we'll look at the xy plane where z equals when, uh, well, that's where z equals zero. So we'll just look anywhere we want, anywhere, okay? And um, we'll just look first at uh, an equipotential of v naught prime, okay? So let's see, one place where we have v naught prime is where x is equal to, or v naught prime times one meter, excuse me. So v naught prime meters. So v naught prime meters is just where x is equal to one meter. So let's go out to some place and call that x equals one meter, right? Well, if, um, so x is equal to one meter, y is equal to zero, that's fine. Uh, let's say y is equal to one meter, right, and x is equal to zero, that's fine. Well, what if x is equal to minus one meter? Same thing. Okay, so we've got something going on there. And um, now what about y is equal to minus one meter? Same thing down on the other side, right? So we're starting to sketch this out just a little bit, finding some points. Um, what about x is equal to one meter and y is equal to one half a meter? Well, that's here. That's going to be the same number, right? One meter, one meter, one half meters. That means this takes a value of one meter, and this takes a value of, you know, this just has the same value of the constant. And that's going to be true all the way up to um, some, the point where x and y are equal, right? So up to these corners, right? 
Same thing down here, we've got absolute values, right? So all the way up to these corners, everything's the same. Now if we come up here to x is equal to um, 1 meter and y is equal to 2 meters, so 1, 2, this guy is not part of this, right? Because that's 2 meters times v naught prime, so that's 2, me 2 v naught prime meters, so it's twice as much. So this point is not part of what's whatever's going on here. Anywhere where y is greater than x is not part. And anywhere where x is greater than y, where y is greater than one meter is not part of it. And anywhere where x is greater than one meter is not part of it. And it has to have one of these two being exactly one meter. It's nice, it's simple, and it's fun. So we have something that looks like that. We have a square. Haven't you ever wondered how to draw a square? Well, that's how you draw a square. Isn't, isn't that cool? So, I mean, that's an implicit function for a square. And if we wanted to go to 2 meters, right, uh, we could do the same thing. Now, a really nice way to do this is just to draw, like, the line x equals y. And draw the line um, x equals minus y. And this is where they switch. Right. This is where where they switch off between going this way and going th this way. So go, 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 go. so now after we've cut off that y, we said what we said that's two meters. We can just draw a straight line, and we can do the same thing here, and we can do the same thing here, and the same thing here. All right, and that's. Um, so if this is v naught prime meters, then this is v not, uh, two v and not prime meters. And we can keep on going out and out and out and out. We've got an infinite number of them because um, we can change what we want v, v to be over here, right? And that's that's exactly what the potential, um, the equipotential diagram is for, is for looking at things that, you know, you think might be a little more complicated, seeing what they mean. And now we know what it means. We've got this square, we've got this sort of square um, potential thing going out. And now we want to figure out, well, what makes it, right? What makes it? Now, I've often done this, um, I've often done this in the, uh, in a slightly different orientation. So if I'm going, the easiest way to write, to do this in the, going up the ladder is to do this at a 45 degree angle from what it is. Um, so that's a good one. Um, so we can use that, right? Um, so yeah, anyways, you know, I often do it the other way around. We can do this down, uh, we can go up, we can go down, right? And we should be able to do the reciprocal things. Now, I don't remember anybody turning in this problem. I remember doing it, and I know I had it in um, last year's problem sets. I'm not sure if I ha have I did it in this year's problem sets, um, but you know it's something that's equally equally doable. We were able to do the um, reciprocal problem, where we start with our charges and go and move and move um, up to the uh, potential. We were able to do that um, two weeks ago. Um, so. But we're going, we're going down, and we can do this now, uh, Gauss's Law. Gauss's Law, just um, for fun, that's E naught, or epsilon naught times um, del dot E, right? So that's our differential form. So that's going to take us down this rung of the ladder from E to rho. Um, and then we have the other um, rung, which goes from here to here, which is uh, E is equal to minus del V, right? Um, again, another very, two very simple applications of this del operator, the gradient and the divergence, bang, bang, bang. Um, you see it, you notice how I saved you from actually snapping my fingers, but this is going to be something that's really easy for you and, I'm, uh, and I, I think it's something that you should be able to do. And I, there's a test a little bit later and that test will include doing things like this in at least three of the problems. So um, let's see what we do. We have a strategy. We need a strategy to go along with this, right? So what I suggest for you 
is that you rewrite v. Okay. So you you're looking at this and you're saying, well, how do I take the derivative of that? Well, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of weird, right? Nobody's told you what the derivative of the maximum function is, right? Um, so you have to rewrite it, and there are different ways you can rewrite it. Um, the one way that I've told you to do this is to rewrite um, rewrite this potential function you know in these four different um, quadrants a b c and d uh, where a is in where a is in between these two line these two lines b is in between these two lines c and so forth for this you can write that potential function really really easy right you just look at it and you know exactly what you're doing uh, you just say okay um, here uh, the x doesn't matter, or the only thing that matters is the y, right? So we have v naught prime y, because in here, in this, in this um, quadrant, y is always greater than x. So um, we just rewrite that, right? And, you know, we're good to go. We can take that and then use it later. Um, then we um, take the gradient, right? And, when, and so we just come over here and we say, okay, we've got this gradient. We'll take the gradient in each one of those, um, in each one of these uh, separate places, and we'll use that to find our field. Right? Um, that is not going to be really, really difficult. And then finally, go ahead and take our divergence, and we'll do our Gauss's law. Right? So this is one of these really, really, really direct problems. Okay. Um, if I just told you to find the sources, and I and I hadn't asked you to find the field in the middle, uh, that would be a, it would be um, a little more complicated. As it is, it's just two one formula problems. I mean, this is as easy as it gets, right? This is high school level, middle school level um, physics, right? Here's an equation. Use it. That that's not college level stuff. It's not college level thinking. Um, the only thing that you're doing here that's complicated is you have to know what's going on with these two, with this gradient, right? And that's something you've done in at least three classes already before you got here. So it's not, there's not a lot new, it's just that you're still, for, you're still not used to using the gradient and we just have to get you used to it, right? So that's the whole reason for giving you this problem, is to get you used to using that gradient. So for V, um, we recently said that in quadrant A, right, at, well, actually we're talking about quadrant B, but in quadrant A, X is always greater than Y, right? So, so the maximum of the absolute value of X and the absolute value of Y is just X. So we have V naught prime times X, right? For the absolute value, X is, X is equal to, uh, X is positive over here, right? So if X is positive, there's no there's no problem, um, and so that's quadrant A. Um, in this quadrant B, we have just quadrant we be not prime y, which is what we already said. Uh, if we go to quadrant C now, the the absolute value of x is larger. So we have v not prime x, but x is negative, and this potential is um, positive definite, right? So we have minus v naught prime times the absolute value of x, or times x, excuse me. So because this is not the absolute value, we need that x, that prime. And you say, well, why didn't we just leave the absolute value in there? And the whole reason for doing that is to get rid of something that's difficult, right? So um, I did show you ways of handling the absolute value sign in taking derivatives, but if we're going to write this out the whole way, then why not just get rid of it while we're write, writing it out, right? And then we don't have to worry about using those additional, um, those additional uh, little tricks which make the derivative so much harder, right? So actually I wouldn't call it hard, but I mean it's something to, it's it's something that you have to do. Um, it's more steps, so 
So I guess that counts as hard ish. Right? So um so now we want to do our minus del v. So when we do that, we take our minus sign and our del and we throw it into the bracket and just do this operation four times. So we have minus and we have our del operator, which is x hat ddx plus y hat ddy. I did notice somebody trying to divide by the del operator in the homework. Um, you can't do that. It's an operator. The inverse operation of of this del uh, of this um, gradient of v, right? The inverse operation of gradient v is the line integral of e. Okay. Um, so we go through each one of these and do the same thing over and over and over. So we've pulled that. Uh, we pulled this operator in here, so we have to do this operation to each one of these um, of these elements. In each one of because each one of these is a different place. We still have to do that same operation in each place, even even though uh, we only have one here because it's only one vector field, right? So now we have v naught prime x, uh, v naught prime y, minus v naught prime x, minus v naught prime y, and we'll close that up and then we'll open it up again. And we do this, well, uh, v naught prime comes out, so we just have the gradient of the, of the coordinate x, which means there's none of that in the y, right? D, dx dy is equal to zero, dx dx is equal to 1, so we just end up with minus um, v naught prime in the x hat direction. And we can go through that same reasoning, and we have the same constant field in each direction, always pointed inwards. Okay? Always pointed um, inwards. So now that we've got that in each one of these quadrants, Quadrant A, quadrant B, quadrant C, and quadrant D. Right? Um, we can go ahead and draw this. Now, I, I think I stipulated that in the problem statement when I gave that to you. Draw it. And that's always good practice anyway, because that's going to help you when you try to use Gauss's law in just a second. Okay. So when we draw this, we draw, you know, we have a constant, um, we have sort of a constant electric field. So we have a bunch of equally spaced um, electric field lines. And they're all in nice cardinal directions, so we don't have to worry too terribly much about what they're doing. Right? They're just being nice and well behaved for us, so we can draw this nice and easily. Like I said, down here in quadrant D, we've got everything pointing up, right? So everything points up in this case. Everything points left, always pointing sort of inward. So everything is looking nice and dandy, pointing inward. And that tells us something right there, right? Just by looking at this, we know that our action is going to be at these two lines. Okay, the action is at these two lines. Our field is coming in here nice and uniform, right? That's, that's okay. You'll notice that switched. I probably should have... Um, done that a little bit differently, but it's too late now because I'd have to get this aligned in the exact um, position. Um, so now we want to use Gauss's law. Okay. Um, I think what you'll find here is if you try to use Gauss's law in this form, right, then um, in this region, you know, we do the same thing. We take take the divergence in each one of these four regions, we'll notice that this, in each one of those four regions, we get zero. 
Yep, no hat, because it's the divergence. So each one of these four regions we get zero, right? So we have no volume charge. So does that mean we have no sources, right? We're looking for our sources using Gauss's law. Does that mean we have no sources? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Obviously, we have some sort of source here because we have a field, right? And the field is changing, right? So we could say that if it was all just a uniform field coming out from way out over here and nothing was changing, then there was there was no um, source. But you know, if we just had you know parallel lines, then uh, there'd be nothing there. But there, we've got changing stuff right here. So how do we take care of that? Well, what did I do in class? Right. Well, in class I wrote out, um, I wrote this out, this is in your book somewhere as well, but uh, I used this um, approximation, or it's not an approximation, I used this rule that um, the charge, the surface charge density at a surface, right, has to be at a surface because it's a surface charge. Uh, is equal to the change in the electric field times the normal direction of that um, of that surface. So we've got four places here, but we really have two. We have x equals y and um, x equals minus y, right? But we can go ahead and do them for all four. I'm not in a hurry with, for time because. That's the nice thing about using the um, using the YouTube to do this, right? Is not in a hurry for time. So um, we'll just go ahead and do it in each for each one of these four lines here: quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, quadrant four. A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four. Just like in high school. Um, and one thing we better find out is that when we do do it here and we do it here, we get the same thing, right? So we've got our we've got our rule here, and so we have to do this rule three four times. So we have e naught in this quadrant one um, of delta e. So here we have it, our quadrant a, right? Um, minus v naught prime x hat, right? I believe. Um, and then over here we have um, minus minus, or over here we have minus v naught prime y hat. So that's actually a plus, and the normal direction here. Uh, the normal direction to this guy is, let's say, this direction, and the normal. So that direction is, um, oh, well, it's the uh, square root of two x x hat, or one over the square root of two x hat plus or minus one over the square root of two y hat. It's pointing down. So uh, one over the square root of two x hat minus. 1 over the square root of 2 y hat, right? And so that's equal to um, what would we say? So we've got a minus here times a plus and a plus here times a minus. So we have a minus epsilon naught um, times a what? 2 v naught prime over the square root of 2, right? So we have the v naught prime over the square root of 2 here, and we have v naught prime over the square root of 2 here. So we get two of those, which is equal to minus the square root of 2 epsilon naught v naught prime. Okay, that makes sense. So let's go over here to this guy. Um, for this one, we have um, epsilon naught is equal to. Okay, so I'm going to 
Okay, so I'm going to keep on going um, counterclockwise. So we have the um, coming down here, we have minus v naught prime y hat, and minus plus v naught prime, so minus plus v naught prime, minus v naught prime x hat, all right, dot, um, so our x hat is still positive, so we have 1 over the square root of 2 x hat, and so is our y hat. So we're going to have minus v naught prime over the square root of 2 plus minus v naught prime over the square root of 2, so that all equals the same thing minus the square root of 2 epsilon naught v naught prime. Okay, so now we'll go from here to here. Keep on doing it in this counterclockwise action. So here we have um, v naught prime x hat uh, minus v naught prime y hat. So that's still um, v naught prime y hat. So that's still uh, going up. That's d d. Okay, so c to d. Right, so just be careful. And then, so we've been pointing outward, so if we're going this way, this way, the normal is that way. So we have one over, or the x is negative now, so we have minus one over the square root of two x hat plus one over the square root of two y hat, it's going, y is increasing which equals minus um, v naught prime over the square root of 2 and minus v naught prime over the square root of 2 summed together. That's the square root of 2 epsilon naught v naught prime. And by now you may have noticed a pattern, right? Uh, but we'll go ahead and finish it off the old-fashioned way just because, all right? So we're going from D to A, so we have V naught prime Y hat minus um, minus V naught prime X hat for quadrant A dot. So we've gone from here to here, our normal's there. So our, if, our, if our normal's there, then um, X is minus, right? So we have minus one over the square root of two x hat plus, or actually y is minus as well, so it's going down and down. So we have minus 1 over the square root of 2 y hat. So we have v naught prime minus v naught prime over the square root of 2 in the x hat direction and plus minus minus times minus is a plus times minus is minus v naught prime over the square root of 2. Um, Again, we end up with just this thing, so minus the square root of 2 epsilon naught v naught prime. So, that's what's going on here, 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 and here. We've actually just got two lines, so we could just write um, that our sigma is equal to uh, minus 2... No, we, we just have two lines with sigma equal to minus the square root of 2 epsilon naught. Ah, okay, let's. Yes, we have minus the square root of 2 epsilon naught v naught prime when x is equal to y or y is equal to x means that in that case, that's those two lines, we have that um, surface charge density, whoops, and zero uh, everywhere else. So they're not equal to each other, it's zero. So we do have a nice happy, um, a nice happy surface charge density, and that's two sheets two sheets that intersect at a, 
at a right angle um, that have this uh, that have this um, uniform surface charge density. So, like I said, what I've normally done is, and I sure I, I'm really sure that I've um, done this in. This was one of the options in your packet because it's always a good one to look at. Is what I, what I've done is I've started with these these two planes, but I've done them at 45 degrees. So I've had one that would be like in the XZ plane, and one would be the YZ plane, right? And I'd given you these, and then you'd use Gauss's law in the integral form to find the field, right? And the field would look this, like this, and this, and this, and this, because you'd superimpose. The field from this one and add this 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 one. So you you know what the from one infinite um, uniformly charged plane. You already know what the answer is. It's a straight electric field going up, and from another one, it's a straight electric field going the other direction. Right. So nice uniform fields in different directions, and you just add them up with the superposition principle. And usually, I use a positive charge, so it would go like that. All right. And then you take that and you'd say, okay, now that I've got this, I can do my line integral stuff. Um, and I probably stipulate that this is um, this point is zero, and then you just do your line integral to any old point that you wanted to, and you'd figure out that if as long as you stayed in this one quadrant, you always ended up something nice and easy. And if you wanted to do a line integral around like that, well, that's your business. I'm, I'm not going to deal with you. Um, and that's the nice, easy thing that I gave you to do. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as I do. I really love it um, doing, some, doing something like this that looks complicated, but is really, really so simple. Right? It's complete and direct, and it looks like it's supposed to be complicated, but there's nothing really hard in it. The only thing that's hard, the only thing that makes this hard is that you want it to be hard. Okay. So, so that makes it a really, really, really good problem is that the only, the only hurdle to this, the only thing that's hard about it, the only thing that is difficult for you is getting yourself to do it. It's a really great problem that way. Um, I'll talk to you later.